I think it's fair to say that gaming CPUs are pretty complicated right now. So what we're going to do in this video is explain literally everything. We're going to get you clocked up to speed with what's been happening, what's going on, regardless of whether you're going to be buying something new or wanting to keep something that you already have, because there are actually numerous updates that have arrived for both AMD, Intel and Windows that can give you better performance and better frame rates in game. Not only that, but Intel have just formally announced their latest desktop gaming CPUs, the Core Ultra 200 range, and AMD are rumoured to be launching their new gaming X3D chips fairly imminently as a counter to this, so there's definitely a lot to think about. So join us as we explain literally everything you need to know about getting the most performance possible out of your gaming PC, and of course some future upgrades that you may or may not want to make to your gaming PC and how it's going to affect you. So join us as we explain literally everything right after a short word from this video sponsor. The new NZXT Compact ATX Mid Tower is here, and the H5 Flow 2024 proves that big things can come in small packages. With a newly recessed motherboard tray, the H5 2024 comes alive, with loads of room to build your PC, and a clean and minimal look that lets your components do the talking. Not only is there mesh on the top and front, but a huge underside intake allows cool air to be fed into the graphics card, with a power supply moved further back to optimize airflow. There is a lot to learn and precious little time, so see what the H5 Flow 2024 can do for you with the link down below. Let's kick things off then by talking about the free performance that you can unlock with your gaming PC today. And I know that this sounds too good to be true, but actually for once with PC gaming, good things really do come to those who want something for free? You see, over the last couple of months, there have been updates to both Windows 11 and your motherboard BIOS, and both of these will affect your CPU speed, and then the FPS that you're going to get in-game. It applies to both AMD and Intel, so no matter which board or chip you have, it's a good time to get yourself updated. And actually, the easiest update that you can make is arguably with Windows. So if you're rocking Windows 11, you can update to the new Windows 11 24H2, which has a really catchy name, but essentially this has some back-end optimization that mainly affects Ryzen CPUs and gives you quite a lot of performance. We've also benchmarked Intel to show you the differences. And we've got a lot of numbers to show you. Just hang on a little longer and I, the wondrous Bench Carl, will walk you through them. Windows 11 24H2 is actually fairly simple to install. Just go over to Windows Update, ensure you tick the box to receive new updates as soon as they're available, and then work through the updates until it's offered, and then get it installed. If you find that you're not offered it, then it's probably because you've still got some existing updates that you have to work through, or it could be that there are some potential incompatibilities with your system, so Windows says, no, if you've got this installed, we're not going to offer it to you until we fix some issues. For example, at the time of filming, there are actually some problems with games that use an earlier version of anti-cheat, so potentially this could be Fortnite or Apex Legends. So if you do play games that has this, you probably won't be offered it until it's fixed, but even if you are, maybe just hold fire for a little bit longer to let it mature. Now the reason why I wanted to hold back the benchmarks just a little bit isn't to be annoying, but it's because there have been a lot going on at the moment, not just with Windows, but also with some BIOS updates. And granted these are happening for different reasons, but essentially these BIOS updates should affect your performance. So I wanted to show you the Windows numbers in tandem with these, so you can see what you're going to gain or I guess potentially lose if you do the required updates. Now AMD have what I would describe as performance based improvements as they optimize their 7000 and 9000 series CPUs with lower latencies which in turn lead to performance gains, at least in theory. Whilst Intel had more serious issues to fix their voltages on their 13th and 14th gen desktop chips and for this reason a BIOS update is definitely highly recommended regardless of the platform that you're on and it is very easy and straightforward to do. Just grab the latest BIOS file and a USB flash drive from the manufacturer's website, whack this in the back of your system, press the delete key as the PC restarts, and then follow the flashing instructions to update your motherboard. Whilst it should go without saying, of course, whenever you are doing an important update or flashing your BIOS, do make sure that your most important data is backed up, as while it should go without a hitch, better safe than sorry. But we have spent a lot of time actually testing all of this stuff to show you the benchmark numbers. So let me hand you over to the man that has been doing all of this, has slaved away, and edited this video, the one, the only, Bench Carl. Hello everyone, it's me, Bench Carl, and it's time for some fun and exciting graphs. In these graphs, you can see we've got our 23H2 results and our 24H2 results side by side, as well as the Intel chips with their microcode updates applied, 
to see how that affects things. Regarding the microcode update, the TLDR is that the microcode update doesn't really reduce your performance in any meaningful way. You might see one or two FPS gained or lost in each game, but that's just margin of error, so that's good news for Intel owners. On the other hand, the Windows 11 24H2 update in Cyberpunk 2077 at 1080p seems to offer outrageous performance gains for Ryzen CPUs, especially the 9700X. These numbers were captured using the built-in benchmark, as I heard this shows a way bigger performance improvement, and I was interested to see by how much. Now, during actual gameplay, the performance increase is a lot less impressive, but I wanted to show you the Cyberpunk numbers before I slowly let you down. What's nice to see in Cyberpunk is performance gains with 24H2 across the board are up, so free FPS gains are always welcome, regardless of your CPU choice. Planet Zoo is up next, and we have more good news for AMD owners, as 24H2 helps to bump up the frame rates and make them slightly more competitive. Though the 7600X did actually see a tiny dip of 2FPS with the update. Again, likely margin of error. Spider-Man Miles Morales did see a bump up in frame rate for AMD chips too, with Intel not really seeing much benefit in this title. Though the 24H2 update didn't manage to fix the weird issue I keep seeing with our 9700X and its 1% lows in this game. However, it is good to see that the microcode updates to these Intel chips in combination with the 24H2 update hasn't seen performance drop off a cliff. Horizon Forbidden West at 1080p doesn't really offer any changes across the board, with only the 14600K seeing a decent increase in FPS overall. Halo Infinite at 1080p offers a different story. Everything is a little bit all over the place. The 14600K and 7600X gained performance, whilst all the other CPUs either matched or lost FPS thanks to the new Windows update. But thanks to those ridiculously high numbers in the Cyberpunk benchmark, our averages look a little bit whack. But overall, we did see moderate gains for the AMD chips in most games, with only Halo Infinite showing us an actual decline in performance. What's good to see though is that Intel believe this latest and final Microco patch has fixed their issues once and for all without affecting performance. Next up, we have the 1440p numbers and the Cyberpunk built-in benchmark is again inflating the numbers. We're seeing huge gains at 1440p with the 24H2 update. We did see a slight drop off with the Intel chips and the microcode update applied in this title, but it's only three FPS and depending on how the PC feels on that day, which way the wind is blowing, or what I even had for breakfast, the numbers can vary by a single percent or two. Enabling ray tracing sees our CPUs get a lot closer together, as more of the load is shifted towards the GPU. What's good though is that FPS increases and doesn't decrease, so you've got to take the wins where you can get them. I think going forward, we'll be looking at benchmarking without the built-in tool, as it's just not reliable enough. We don't use it for any other game, so it makes sense to stop. Horizon Forbidden West at 1440p isn't one of those titles where you can take those wins, unfortunately, unless you're using an Intel CPU. Performance remains the same or a slight increase, but the AMD CPUs see a pretty big drop off, with the 7600X losing as much as 11 FPS with the 24H2 update applied. The 9700X lost around 8 FPS, and on average from our three runs, the 7700 lost 3 FPS. In Halo Infinite, the AMD CPUs hit a wall around 255 FPS or so, and the 24H2 update doesn't enable our RTX 4090 to push past that. It does, however, let the 14700K and 14600K get a lot closer, though it can't save the woeful 1% lows we see from Intel in this game. Spider-Man Miles Morales at 1440p sees a performance decrease of 5 FPS for the 14600K, whilst the 14700K remain constant. The 7600X and 7700 both see an improvement, while the 9700X remains about the same as well. Planet Zoo at 1440p sees more improvements for Intel and AMD across the board, other than the 7600X, which once again sees a regression in performance. A little bit strange, that one. Now, averaging things out at 1440p, you can see marginal gains across the board, a couple FPS here or there. Depending on the game you play and the CPU you have, you can see really big improvements in particular titles, as well as no benefit whatsoever, or even a slight performance decrease. Now, the biggest decrease we did see was going from 163 to 152 FPS in a game like Horizon Forbidden West at 1440p. A game where millions of people play this on the PS5 at 30 FPS, so you can't really worry too much about that one. After reading a lot of news posts, I was expecting great things from the 24H2 update, but it appears as if some big improvements were cherry-picked by some websites for a bit of a clickbait news title. But reading more reviews and watching more videos from other creators, I'm happy with what we've seen here falls in line with the majority. 24H2 mostly offers a good improvement across the board, or more or less the same performance, but like Marcus said, I'd wait for Microsoft to patch and fix the issues with anti-cheat first to avoid any headaches with games. As far as the Intel side of things are concerned, I'm happy to see that the microcode update hasn't reduced performance in order to keep their chips in line, but is this finally the last we'll hear about the issues affecting their 13th and 14th gen chips? Only time will tell. And maybe what Marcus has to talk about next 
will at least distract everyone a little bit. So then, how about that? I did say, as my voice seems to be going higher and higher, that there were definitely some pretty good performance gains to be had. But we've actually been playing, planing, we've been hiding something in plain sight this whole time because today actually marks the announcement of Intel Core Ultra 200 series. Hooray! And we actually have them. And these look to be very, very interesting indeed. Whether these are going to take the crown from AMD, eh, we're going to have to find out, but it definitely should be a bit of a close contest. Releasing in late October, these new Intel CPUs are the next generation Team Blue chips, and they will need a new motherboard and DDR5 memory in order to function. And this time around, they're definitely doing things a little bit differently, as unusually for Intel, it's all about keeping power consumption down, with them quoting roughly the same gaming performance as 14th gen, but whilst using half the power. And at this stage, I've got to admit, I am a little bit confused, because whilst I understand that the default states, as I say, will use less power, because these are unlockable chips, you can obviously overclock them, it might mean that we can get loads more performance if you use the same amount of power as the previous generation, or it might be that there's not actually that much more room in these chips and you could push it but you won't be getting masses more performance. To me, roughly the same gaming performance as previous gen doesn't exactly get me excited. I mean, it's long overdue that the power consumption of these things came down, but as I say, same gaming performance as 14th gen, which was the same as 13th gen, doesn't exactly um, get me a tingle. I don't really know what I'm trying to say. We do have some initial figures, but these have come from Intel. Obviously, we're going to have to do the testing ourselves to see the full picture, but they do look to be around about 18% faster in Cinebench mode and 8% faster in Cinebench Single. So definitely a step forward for productivity, and again, whilst using less power. And that last bit is actually a lot more important than it might sound, because most of us are gamers, some of us care about productivity, and many of us don't, okay? We want a good overall system, but not everyone is obviously using their PC for work all the time. We're gamers, that's typically what we do. But Cinebench Single Threaded is actually a pretty good indication of gaming performance. So it's not one-to-one, -one, but usually if you're gonna get an 8% uh, performance gain in Cinebench Single, then across the board you'd probably be looking roughly 8% better gaming performance, which wouldn't be amazing, but I, I guess we'd take it, right? It's better. But for Intel to then say that the game of performance is going to be similar to 14th gen, but we are getting 8% better in Cinebench, you might work out that something doesn't quite add up. And the reason for this is because they've essentially changed the architecture now, and one of the main changes of that is that we don't have hyper-threading anymore. So on Intel's performance cores, you would have two threads running on each core, and as to say that's not the case anymore and one of the benefits of this essentially I guess is that it makes it like a bit more simple when it comes to the architecture but it's mainly for power consumption that's one of the reasons why uh, the power has come down and this is great for laptops but in terms of desktop CPUs they were running too hot before arguably but we don't want to miss out on performance so this to me is kind of like 14.5 rather than 15th gen. Maybe that's why they've swapped over finally to Core Ultra because they're starting again and obviously the performance of this can then increase over time. As long as they are keeping the TDPs of these down, fantastic. But if we're not necessarily going to get better gaming performance, then loads of us just aren't going to upgrade. In fact, I actually have very real concerns that the performance is going to be a bit all over the place when it comes to gaming, as the graphs they showed us in the briefing actually showed wild gains and losses versus the previous generation. Not to mention these harrowing words from Intel directly. As the 7800X3 is generally faster than the 9950X, do you expect 285K to lose against that part in gaming? I think what we said is we showed some data on the 7950 X3D. Um, based on my understanding of the performance, it's that part is within a couple percent. So um, I think we'll be about 5% back versus X3D parts, which we, we feel really, really good about considering uh, we have just the, the cache that's built into the CPU and the great IPC of the product. But yeah, you'll see about a 5% deficit, and I want to be clear about that. Yikes, that is not the quote you would expect Intel to be coming out with when launching a brand new product that, granted, isn't just aimed at gamers, but, you know, a large proportion of people that will buy these are gamers, and they're already emitting defeat, versus a product that's almost two years old when there's something else coming out in the not-too-distant future. I mean, that's not where I would want to be if I was launching a brand new line of CPUs. But obviously, to be fair, you know, apples to apples, this is, you could argue, more, like, close closely aimed at something like the uh, 9900X, so if this actually beeps those out in terms of performance when we test it, then those will be better. But the main thing that I keep thinking is, 
Why don't Intel just launch their own comparable products? If we know that you can put a load of extra cash inside a CPU, why not actually compete rather than just saying, well, you know, that's different to us, a different target audience. Why would you not want a piece of that? But as I say, let's reserve our full judgment until we actually get them in for some build guides. We start testing, we do the reviewing, and we see how they stack up. But obviously, AMD are rumored to counter Intel this month or next with a new 9800X3D, which is gonna be an eight core pure gaming chip that could be around about 10% faster than the outgoing 7800X3D, which again is apparently around about 5% faster than these new chips. So yeah. And it doesn't even stop there because AMD's secret sauce could actually be something completely different this time around with the launch of the 9900X3D and the 9950X3D as rumors peg these to launch in January with a difference. Because you see, on the previous generation, if you did want to go in for these like 12 and 16 core X3D chips, you were doing so with a compromise because you had two different core clusters in two CCDs essentially. So you had eight cores, eight cores or like eight and then four for the 12 core. And there was a latency issue because all of the cache was only on one of these CCDs. So you would actually run into, I don't want to say performance issues, but you weren't getting as much performance as you would have done if you'd gone for the eight core variant because all of that cache was on one CCD and that's all you essentially had on the chip. It was the best case scenario for gaming. It was simpler and it just worked the best. So it was a little bit annoying because if you were going to use it for productivity and you did want to go for a higher core count, you're paying more money, but you had to compromise on gaming performance whereas you could spend less, get better gaming performance, but then not get core count. Whereas this time, it actually looks like we have rumors that we're gonna get extra cash on both CCDs, which essentially means you wouldn't have to choose now between gaming performance and more cores. You could literally get both. Whether this is true and how well it's gonna work, whether there be like a core provisioning service or something like you had on the previous generation that was still a little bit of a software issue, we don't know yet, but it may well be that if you spent more and you get like the best X3Ds, then you're gonna get even more performance in certain games versus the 9800X3D, which would be amazing unless you're Intel. So yeah, we are definitely in a very interesting time right now for gaming CPUs, regardless of whether you want to keep what you have, update, get even more performance, or you're looking to buy something new. There's a lot going on and there's definitely a lot to think about. It definitely does seem like a little bit more of a slam dunk for AMD at the moment though, with more performance on both the Windows and BIOS updates, Intel admitting defeat in pure gaming before they've even launched the product, and then of course the 13th and 14th gen saga with more X3D from Ryzen to come. It's definitely gonna take a lot of work for Team Blue to win back the crown. But as I'm sure you are, I'm definitely excited to see them try. And again, it's not all about gaming performance. Productivity comes into it. What is the sweet spot going to be? What's going to win out? What is pricing, availability? All of this stuff going to be like only time will tell. So get yourself subscribed if you're not already, as we'll be doing builds with these. And if the new Ryzen CPUs do land, obviously we'll be testing them too. We get Editor Carl to do all of his benchmarks and we'll be looking at everything in great details. But this video and all of the other videos we do take a lot of work, so smash the like button if you've enjoyed this, it really helps out. And of course, if you do want to check out current pricing on this PC, you can find affiliate links to that listed down below. And while you're down there, why not check out the new NZXT H5 Flow 2024. Coming in both black and white, RGB or solid, this new case does things differently and offers a truly clean aesthetic for your gaming PC. It supports a 360 radiator on the front or a 240 up top and it fits a whopping total of 8 120mm fans. You can even opt for the RGB version that uses NZXT sweet new F360 single fan frame for hassle-free wiring, cooling and lighting. Learn more about this epic case today with the link down below. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. We'll catch you in the next one.